still have like 30 seconds left, but <laughs> you can take some time and you can stand up or sit, whatever you're comfortable with. And then we will be starting with I Speak Jesus this morning.
today we come into your presence and we're so thankful for the truth behind this song and the songs that we've sang. We're thankful again for uh, the fact that our relationship with you is based on what Jesus did on the cross. And no matter who we are, no matter what we've done, no matter where we came from, thank you again that your blood covers our sin and it's through forgiveness of that sin that we have eternal life. And so thank you for these few moments we've had to worship you this way. We know that you're in our midst, and we know that you have a plan for our lives. And so may we meet with you today. May you continue to speak to us and encourage us during this time. And so we give you our praise, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, church, before you sit down, we're going to encourage you to walk around, greet one another. We are so glad that you're here today at Grace Community Fellowship Church. All right, church, if you can find your way back to your seats. We had the air conditioning on this morning because we knew you guys were going to warm it up a little bit in here. It's been a a pretty, I don't know, crazy morning. We had a string break on the guitar, but we had an E string in the back, so which is good. We were able to fix that. I think why they were doing their worship set They broke a pick, and uh, that means they're really playing, right? We like that. We like breaking equipment when it's for the Lord, I guess. But um, no, in all seriousness, we're thankful that as we come together, yeah, we warm the place up, and we put sugar and donuts and all kinds of food in our bodies while we're together in fellowship. But hopefully when you come to church and you go to leave church, you're different than the way you came, right? Even if it's just your attitude, because attitude is something that's affected by where we're at with the Lord. And and so um, our prayer every Sunday as we gather in this place is that God will meet us and uh, show up and speak to us and encourage us. And so thank you for uh, being here today. Thank you for those that are listening online. And we pray that as we spend time in the word today that we'll all grow together in our faith. We're in this series, How to Pray. And this is number two of a three-part series. And Lord willing, next week, Hank will be up here to do our final part of the Lord's Prayer. I know I was just on vacation, but I have one more granddaughter that is going to have a baby dedication, and that's next week. And so I'll be at a church in Omaha with my uh, kids and grandkids. And so uh, Hank will have a chance to close off this, uh, this series But I want to highlight just a few things that we talked about last week. Here's just a few bullet points that I think summarizes where we went last week with the Lord's Prayer. 
we uh, wanted to remind everybody that when we pray, every time we pray, we get to talk and we get to listen to the God of the universe. I mean, he's the God of the universe, right? When we talk and when we pray, and most of us probably need to work on the, the listening part more, me definitely included, but when we talk and listen, we're listening to the God of the universe. And the God of the universe deserves to be honored. He deserves to be respected. And uh, there needs to be a holy fear. The name of Jesus is powerful. And we even looked into scripture at how important it is for us to realize that there's power in the name of Jesus. And Jesus himself uh, reminded us to pray. Reminded us to trust that his father was in control and he's all powerful and so we're going to uh, begin like we did last week with the Lord's Prayer and I want to give you just some context again that um, the Lord's Prayer at least what we're going to look at in Matthew chapter 6 uh, is surrounded by Jesus talking to the hypocrites there were these hypocritical warnings and um, Jesus was saying don't be hypocritical in your giving don't be hi hypocritical in your praying. Don't be hypocritical in the way you live your life. And um, he addressed even fasting. And so as believers today, yeah, we want to focus on the prayer, the Lord's Prayer, and what does that mean? But hopefully you took away from last week that when we pray, it needs to be real. It needs to be authentic. And so um, the... The Lord's Prayer is also recorded in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 11, but we're going to go ahead and use the King James Version of our text, and if you want to repeat with me, here's the Lord's Prayer. You can say it along with me. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I actually added ever in there twice. Because I love the fact that what we believe is an eternal thing. When you have a relationship with Jesus Christ and you understand who it is we're praying to, this is an eternal thing. And uh, this conversation that God wants us to have with him daily um, is all just in preparation for living with him in eternity. So let's go into where we left off last week. And let's look at the phrase, give us this day our daily bread. This idea that every time you and I pray, we, uh, we go to a, an all-powerful God. We go to th the God of the universe. We have audience with him, and we can go to him about everything. <laughs> we can go to him about everything, and we're told by Jesus himself that we're supposed to do that daily. We can go to him daily, and we can talk to him about everything that's physical, everything that's emotional, and everything that's spiritual. If you thought that church is just this place you go so that you understand faith, you're right. That's what church is about. But church is a, a place you can go to experience physical healing, emotional healing, and, of course, spiritual healing. You see, only God can meet all our needs. Proverbs uh, 30, verse 8, talks about, the, the writer of Proverbs here, talks about the fact that, especially when it comes to physical things, it's, you know, we can have too much and then not go to God and thank him. Or we can have too little and then dishonor God. But when you and I pray, not just the Lord's Prayer, but our prayer life should be about thanking God for everything we have. It should be about going to God and saying, God, we need more of you. We need you to help us be more physically able to get through life. We need you, God, to work on those things that are emotionally broke. We need to be able to go to God however we're feeling. But uh, we also go to God for spiritual healing. Let's start with physical. In Luke chapter 12, verses 29, and then I'm just going to read 31 in addition to that. 
we have these familiar words. Um, Jesus is speaking. And don't be concerned about what you eat and what to drink. Don't worry about such things. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and he will give you everything you need. So by a show of hands, raise your hand if when you go out to eat and you get a menu, you become overwhelmed. And sometimes it takes you a little bit of time to make your decision. Okay, that's that show of hands. Now raise your hand if when you go out to eat and they hand you a menu, you don't even need to look at it because you know exactly what you're going to order. That's me, right? And I forget that uh, not everyone has already thought through what they're going to eat at that restaurant. We are supposed to go to God about everything, right? We pray at our meals to remind ourselves that this meal that we're about to eat comes from God. And he's the one that meets our physical needs. And it's this beautiful picture that, uh, that we have in the scriptures, uh, not only of praying to God because he's the God of the universe, but if you think back, when Jesus would do a miracle, what did he do? He'd hold up the bread and bless it, and then God multiplied it, did that with the fish. And so there, there's something just amazing that God can do, even with our physical things, right? Let's talk about the emotional part. In the book of Psalms, Psalms 1, 143, we have a couple of words, a couple of verses here that I want to read. And the psalmist says, come quickly, Lord, and answer me, for my depression deepens. Don't turn away from me or I will die. For the glory of your name, O Lord, preserve my life. Because of your faithfulness, bring me out of this distress. I'm not going to make you raise your hand, but um, anybody distressed today? Anybody discouraged? Anybody depressed? I love the song that we opened up with the start of the service. And one of the reasons why we do worship at the beginning is for a long time we didn't do that. We started with announcements. We started with offerings and all this other stuff. And it was 15 to 20 minutes into the service that we'd finally mention the name of Jesus. But uh, what I loved about today is the first song was I Speak Jesus. And there's a, there's a verse in that song that talks about how Jesus can even help us overcome depression. And in the church, so often we ignore the fact that, that yeah, we go through difficult things. Sometimes we're discouraged. Sometimes we're depressed. Um, we should pray, right, during those times, realizing that just because we pray, it doesn't mean we snap out of it. But we're reminded in the scripture, even from the psalmist, that sometimes there's going to be things that are emotionally going to be just overwhelming. And it's in those overwhelming times, those emotional lows, that we're told to pray. Let's go to the spiritual peace. Jesus in John chapter 6 says this. He says, I'm the bread of life, and whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Anybody ever been really, really hungry? Have you ever fasted, right, and prayed? The reason why we fast and pray is so that we recognize and we recognize within ourselves that what's more important is not the food, but a hunger for God's presence. And sometimes until we fast, we, we, um, we're driven by the one and not the other. It's easier to feed one appetite then do what we need to do to, to just wait for God, wait for God's presence to show up. This verse, Jesus is saying, yeah, when you pray, there's a spiritual component to this. You need God's help in your life. You need him to restore your soul. You need your hunger fulfilled by him and him alone. This idea of coming in the original text, it means to come to to set out after, it also means to resort to. And oftentimes we, we don't go to God in prayer until last resort. Until we're spiritually dying, then we go to God and we beg him and we pray to him. But Jesus says, no, um, when you pray, go to God daily. This is how you pray daily. Go to God, find, find your comfort 
find your peace, find everything you need, but find that daily in God, and he'll meet everything that you have as a need. He'll fulfill your thirst and your hunger. You see, nothing is more satisfying, nothing is more satisfying and fulfilling than God. Nothing. There's nothing out there that's more satisfying and fulfilling than God. All right, so since uh, Saturday was a little odd, right, we had Veterans Day that fell kind of on the weekend. Um, I would like the veterans in the building to stand up real quick. We're just going to, we're not going to ask you to talk. All you have to do is stand up. We'll give you applause. I see Mike in the back. Come on, veterans, stand up. I know who you are. All right, let's give. <laughs> and Ricky, Ricky's up. All right, you guys can sit down. Ricky's up because when he goes for rides with his pastor, I have him salute every flag we go by. And so you know how to salute, Ricky. I'm very proud of you. Now, uh, one thing that all of these individuals have in common, no matter what branch of service they served in, is they have had a chance to, to experience food in the military. Doesn't matter what era, right? Uh, there was this thing for some of the older veterans called sea rations. And then for some of the newer veterans, we experienced what they called MREs, right? Meals ready to eat. And um, it didn't matter if it was sea rations or meals ready to eat. There's only so much of it you can eat. And pretty soon you're like, I can't eat any more of this. Uh, most of our training exercises or most of the times when I had to eat a lot of MREs, I got to the place where the only thing I would do is I'd open the MRE and I'd find the candy which was Skittles, and I would eat Skittles, and I would eat that nonstop. I ate a lot of Skittles to the place where after a while your mouth is like raw because you've had so much sugar and all that stuff that goes with it. Uh, but when you've eaten out of a can or you've eaten out of a bag for uh, consecutively over and over and over again, you long for the day you get hot chow. And even in the U.S. military, when they bring – the trailer is in, and they start pulling out the hot chow. It doesn't really matter how bad it tastes or how bad it looks. It's still better than sea rations and MREs, and you eat it up. If you haven't already figured out, those in the military know how to put it down, and they put it down fast. If you watch your pastor, I'm usually the first done at the table I'm sitting at, except if Mike's sitting there or some of these other veterans, they can put it in quicker than me. It's, it, you eat it fast, and the reason why you eat it fast is because it gets cold really fast. So if you want hot chow, you want to enjoy it. So you eat it fast, all right? And you don't know what's going to happen next. They could take your plate away, or you may have to move, and so you eat it fast. But nothing compares to a steak. You know, Texas Roadhouse has figured this out. They know how to take care of veterans. And on Veterans Day, they provide a voucher now where you can go there on Veterans Day, and they give you a free steak. And I'm telling you, it's hard to beat a steak, a good steak that's cooked well. When I say well, I don't mean well done, but just cooked right. So three examples, right? MREs and sea rations, hot chow, I won't tell you what the, how the veterans describe some of their hot chow. All kinds of nicknames. And then a steak. Which one is the best? Hot chow, no. <laughs> My opinion, the steak from Texas Roadhouse is the best. But so often in life, we, we forget. We try to fill all these. We, f we try to fill our physical needs with things that aren't from the Lord. We, we, we try to fill the emotional needs we have without the Lord. We, even spiritually, we look for other ways to try to live out our faith. And we forget that biblically, you can't have faith unless you're dependent upon the Lord. And my point is this, that when you pray, you're supposed to remember you're praying to the God of the universe. And he can meet all your needs. And he can do it in a way that's way better than anything else you can invent or come up with. But we go on. We go to the next phrase. Forgive us our trespasses or forgive us our debts, right? A couple different words that are used. This is the idea that when we pray, we need to make sure that um, we deal with our words, our thoughts, and our deeds. 
all of us have things that need to be addressed. And, and that account builds up over time. But we need to go to the Lord daily. And we need to, we need to, we need to allow those things to be brought to mind so that God can address those things. You see, God is wholly righteous while we are not. We receive righteousness when we have Jesus in our lives, and we begin this journey of uh, taking on his holiness and his righteousness. But when we go to God in prayer, he's holy and righteous beyond what we can even imagine. If we, if we thought about it too long, we probably would end up bowing in fear. Because God is so holy and so righteous. But he still invites us to come to him in prayer, to have a conversation with him. And he wants us to think through our trespasses, through our misdeeds, through the things that are still maybe not right in our, in our lives. Let's look at words, first of all. Words, thoughts, and deeds. James 3, 7 through 10 says, People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and our Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Okay, does anybody have any regrets of what you said this last week? Maybe just one regret, right? Sometimes it's the slip of the tongue. Sometimes it's afterwards you think, man, where did that come from? And sometimes it was just an accident, right? But, but the tongue is a hard thing to tame. And I think it's good for us to reflect on the things we say to each other or the things we don't say to each other. Maybe God is telling us to say something and we don't. And we, we in our prayer time, we need to tell God to forgive us for those words. How about thoughts? Mark chapter 7, verses 20 through 23. And then he added, it is what comes from inside that defiles you. For from within, out of a person's heart, out of a person's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these vile things come from within, and they are what defile you. You see, Jesus was trying to emphasize to his followers again that, yeah, we can get all hung up on the stuff on the outside, but what really defiles you is what's on the inside. In fact, Jesus would say that what is happening on the inside, you won't be able to keep a lid on it. It's going to come out of your mouth, probably when you least expect it. And so we're supposed to go to the Lord in prayer, and we're supposed to ask him to forgive Sometimes even just the thoughts. I don't know about you, but sometimes, uh, sometimes that takes time. We have to we have to pause. We have to allow God to reveal those things that maybe we've been thinking about that need to be get addressed and need to be forgiven. But that's what we're supposed to do. Let's go to deeds. James chapter four verse seventeen says, "Remember, it is a sin." to know what you ought to do, and then not do it. Raise your hand if when you were told to be a Christian, you needed to quit sinning, right? It's usually part of the gospel, right? If you're going to if you're gonna be a Christian, if you're going to come to Christ, you need to quit sinning. And oftentimes in the gospel, when we present the gospel message, we, we focus so much on what you need to stop doing, and you need to turn to God, and, and then you're saved. But... Sin is also knowing what you should do, but then not doing it. And, and so sometimes when we focus on sin, we, we focus our definition on sin. We're focused on what we've done wrong. But we need to go to God in prayer and say, okay, God, as I think through what I didn't do yesterday, was there something I didn't do that's a sin? A little different perspective. So, um, as we look at this idea of deeds, we're reminded that one of the definitions of sin in the Bible is to miss the mark. I think this came up in our Bible study or our, our men's ministry on Saturday. 
we were talking about sometimes the words we say. We were talking about swearing um, and where that stuff come, comes from, and it comes from our hearts. And we talked about how over time we justify what we say and how we say it because we've kind of moved the marker. We've missed the target. And then to make ourselves feel better, we say it's okay. Uh, I didn't hurt anybody with my words. But sin is just missing the mark, and it's God's mark, not the mark that you and I create so that we feel better about our sin. I'm going to suggest, just like I did on Saturday, that oftentimes that the words we say, the, the deeds that we do come from unresolved heart issues, and those unresolved heart issues can lead to poor judgment, and to bad decisions, and to sin. Um, I think of the next slide. I got a picture of uh, what happened on Friday at the uh, high school, and uh, kind of a crazy bunch of men. And there is a woman in there, uh, so I don't want to just say men. We were trying to get more and more women to be a part of the local American Legion, but we did. Uh, we did the the Veterans Day program in the high school. And this is a picture taken. If you see Jerry Kaiser this week, I don't see him at church today. You can say you saw a picture of him. Doesn't he look mad there? <laughs> Sorry, Jerry, that's the only picture I had. He wasn't mad. He was very passionate. And the reason why Jerry was kind of passionate is we had found out right before this Veterans Day program, within a few days before this, that we weren't allowed to pray in the local high school. I don't, even, I don't even know how to talk about this because I don't want to sin by the way I talk about this. Um, you can probably tell by how I'm talking about this that I wasn't happy with this. Here's veterans, men and women that have chosen to uh, stand up, put a uniform on that has the flag, the colors of their country, and then they're told they can't mention God in a prayer in the public high school. My, uh, my wife had to help me process this a little bit because I still have some fight in me, and, uh, and I wasn't real happy. And I was uh, trying to think through, well, how am I going to make a statement? You know, in church, we want to speak the name of Jesus. This is a public place. I still want to speak the name of Jesus. But I've been told that if I did, then uh, they'd find someone else to lead that portion of the program. And so I went back and forth, back and forth. And I realized that God didn't want me to even sin um, in the middle of standing up for something that I felt he was telling me to stand up for. And I had to be really careful with my words. And I had to be careful with the word that I gave uh, to the local administration that I wouldn't pray. So it went off without a hitch. I did my duty. I ended the portion of the, the program with forgotten country, and that's all I said. I show you this picture, and I tell you the story, because even when we stand up for injustices, or we take a stand as believers in Jesus Christ, we have to be careful we don't fall into sin. And I realized that I still had some things as a veteran, and maybe even unresolved issues that went back all the way to high school where you have people telling you you can't talk about this and you can't do this and you can't pray in school and you can't take a stand here. I had a lot of unresolved things and I had to step back from that and say there's going to be a time in a godly way to stand up to this. But it has to be done in a way that I don't sin and I don't cause other people to sin. So that's why when we pray, right, we go to God in prayer and we ask him to bring to the surface those things that are sinful so that our sin doesn't hinder our prayers. And I'm still working on that, and you can continue to pray that we handle this well. Because unresolved heart issues can lead to poor judgment and sin. Let's go to the final part of what we're going to address today. This phrase, as we forgive our trespassers, or as we forgive our debtors. 
This is how do we have these kinds of conversations with others that maybe don't believe the same thing, but how do we also forgive them? How, how do we live out relationships where we're careful not to be judgmental? How do we give them grace? And how do we even seek out peace? I, um, I, I hope you remember the last series we preached on and talked about. You remember the study on Jonah? And hopefully all of us would agree that Jonah received a lot of mercy from God. And then he was supposed to show mercy, which was hard for him to do. But I love, just as much as I love the word grace, because that's the name of our church, uh, as I get older and I real, realize my mistakes and my sinfulness, I love the, the doctrine and the understanding of mercy. And you and I, when we pray, we're supposed to remind ourselves the mercy we've been shown so that we go out and show that mercy to others. This, this idea of mercy, of course, uh, Jesus tells a story. We're not going to look at this text. But if you want to do this this week, read the parable again of the servant who owed his master lots and lots of money. And how he begged for forgiveness, right? And then once he received it, then he went out and demanded people to pay their debts to him. And I'll let you kind of come up with your own conclusion, but Jesus Jesus was bothered by that. And Jesus is also bothered by us when we, when we hold on to unforgiveness because we've been forgiven of so much. So let's look at this concept first of non-judgmental, what it looks like to treat each other in a non-judgmental way. James 4, 11 through 12 says, Don't speak evil against each other, dear brothers and sisters. If you criticize and judge each other, then you're criticizing and judging God's law. But your job, your job is to obey the law, not to judge whether it applies to you. God alone, who gave the law, is the judge, and he alone has the power to save or to destroy. So what right do you have to judge your neighbor? That, that came up, uh, someone shared a story in our Sunday school class this morning, how easy it is to look on the outward appearance of others and make a judgment of them, and how that's probably incorrect it's not right it can lead to sin let's look at gracious what it looks like to be gracious Colossians chapter 4 live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you have the right response for everyone I struggled a little bit with that one this last week it's probably why I, I rewrote my email two or three times I waited a few hours before I sent it. My wife thought I should have waited about a day, and she was probably right, because everything looks different the next day. But how are we gracious, even in our response? Let's look at this text, what it means to be a peacemaker. Matthew chapter 5, so if you're presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you, leave your sacrifice there at the altar, go and be reconciled to that person, and then come and then offer your sacrifice to God. This idea of reconciled, there's all kinds of different definitions. I'm going to give you a few, and then I'll, I'll focus on the one that I want to talk about today as we close off this time. It means to change, to be changed thoroughly. It means to be restored in a relationship. But I want to focus on it means to overcome hostility with peace. This, this idea of being reconciled to one another, it's, <laughs> there's this beautiful thing that happens when we forgive others. And reconciliation sometimes just means that we're overcoming this hostility that's in our own heart, and it's replaced with peace. And when you and I forgive others, like we've been forgiven, there's something miraculous that happens in us. We, we have peace. You see, reestablishing trust isn't always possible with others, but we can have a clear conscience about how we treat them. I d <laughs> I'm going to tell you a story real quick, and, um, and it, wasn't, it wasn't easy, but um, over vacation, I had shared with our elders that 
there had been a former staff person in our church, Adam Kyle, who, if you listen, Adam, you know that I'm sharing from my heart here, that um, when he was here and he left, uh, it wasn't the greatest departure, even though we as a church kept a lot of that quiet. And as we, as we worked through that, that difference, and Adam and Mary left, um, they moved to Colorado. They were in Colorado for a while. And then they ended up taking a pastorate job in Oskaloosa. Now, anybody that knows Carrie and I, we're both from Oskaloosa. It's our hometown. And so um, I found out, of course, because I have a cousin who's a pastor in the town. And, and he said, hey, I met a guy that said um, that he used to be at your church. And he's a pastor now here in town. And I, I thought, no, that can't be Adam. I thought Adam was in Colorado. And so little by little, all these things kept coming up. Adam and Mary are in Oskaloosa. So I went to my elders because um, I had uh, worked really hard at letting go of some things and then some other things that happened in the church. And I had some things that kind of were built up in my heart again where I'm like, just every time his name was mentioned, I was having a problem with it. So I mentioned it to my elders and I said to them, I said, hey, the next time I go back to Oskaloosa, I'm going to take a step um, towards just making sure I'm at peace with this relationship. I don't want my ministry to be hindered. I don't want my prayers to be hindered. And so I said, if I see Adam at the church, I'm going to stop in and talk to him. Bless you. So the first time we go back to Oskaloosa, I don't see Adam. We drive by two or three times. And this time on vacation, the first day back in Oskaloosa, um, I see a Jeep. And I pull into the parking lot. Well, I asked my wife first. I said, okay, if I follow through with this, she said, yeah, I'll stay in the car. I pull into the parking lot. I walk in. I walk right into the back of the church, walk up to him, hug him. We began to talk. And, of course, I was probably more comfortable than he was because I had prepared my heart for this moment. And we talked, probably spent 10, 15 minutes together. He came out, talked to my wife, gave her a hug. And then he shook my hand again, gave me another hug. And he said, hey, call me sometime. And I just shook my head, got in the car, and I left. I tell you the story because taking a step in forgiving people is never easy. It, will I call Adam again? Probably not. Um, if I see Adam now, I'm going to feel a lot better about it because I took a step. And forgiveness... Forgiveness is just taking a step. And when you take that step, it doesn't mean that you change the person. <laughs> it just gives you peace. And so the Lord's Prayer is always reminding us that sometimes we need to take a step and we need to forgive others like we've been forgiven. And when you and I do that, we can be at peace. We can have a clear conscience. I um, I want us as a church to be honest. I want us to have heartfelt prayers. And the reason why that's important is because when we're honest with God and we have heartfelt prayers, it prepares our lives to receive things that are miraculous. But if we don't address those deep hurts and those things that are hard to deal with, then our prayers are hindered. Uh, the scripture reminds us that um, in particular, men, if your relationship with your wife isn't right, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, we're reminded that your prayers will be hindered. And I would suggest the same is true with other relationships with other believers, brothers and sisters in Christ. And so today, what I want us to do is I want us to think through three questions and then we're going to do something different at the end of the service. We're going to hit pause after I pray. And then we're going to do our offering. And we're going to do our announcements. And then I'm going to ask the praise band to come back up. And we're going to sing a worship song. And then we're going to open the altar up again today. When I say altar, that means you can come forward if you choose. And we're going to pray. And we're going to take to the Lord these things that are in our hearts that we want to address today and we want to leave it before him 
so that we can be at peace. We don't have to carry it anymore. We don't have to hold on to it. It's not going to be awkward if we run into this person. So here's the three questions. Number one, are there any unresolved issues that I need to discuss with God today? Number two, what relationship in my life needs attention? And I'm going to suggest today. Number three, what steps can I take to begin letting go of my hostility? That's all I'm emphasizing today. I'm not saying that uh, you're going to feel better uh, the next time you see the person necessarily. Um, I feel better when I do this. But we're letting go of our hostility. We're asking God to work again. We're asking God to hear our prayers so they're not hindered. Those are the three questions that I want us to think about today. So let's think about those now as I close in prayer. God, today we are thankful again that you have not only told us to pray, but you've showed us how to pray, and then you explained to us what it looks like when we um, do pray. And we as a church, doesn't matter if we're teenagers or adults, we can hold on to things, and in the end, those things can hinder you from really uh, doing what you want to do in our lives. And so we want to be the kind of church where we address um, all things to you, we, we trust you, we rely on you, and we know that you can do anything. So today, um, bring to our minds the answers to these questions, and may we, out of sincerity and out of honesty, and maybe even out of brokenness, I pray today that, that we um, lay before you our hurts and uh, we begin to forgive. So thank you for this time. Continue to work among us today. In Jesus' name, amen.